Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the day today. We have a very, very interesting presentation for you today uh, with uh, an amazing instructor, Mr. Steve Vorenkamp. Mr. Vorenkamp is the co-owner of Vorenkamp Well Control Training and Engineering Services. He's a third generation oil and uh, gas industry expert in well control and MWD directional drilling. He holds three technical patents for safe well site data collection systems. He is also a 2014 Marietta College honorary. He is IADC and SPE lecturer, um, LCU and Tulane University alumni in business and earth sciences, and international trainer for more than 25 years and a U.S. Navy veteran. Over to you, sir. Well, good, uh, good afternoon to everyone from wherever you are. I'm happy to be with you from College Station, Texas. The talk we're giving today is going to be about kick tolerance, uh, why this is important and what it relates to. Um, this is the first time for me doing this sort of medium, so bear with me, if you will. And uh, let's, uh, let's move to the important part of kick tolerance and in, in, in kick intensity is, is all about staying away from problems on the rig site. And because of that, it's a very important component of, uh, of well control and, and, uh, and drilling a well. Um, because of that, it takes in several uh, different items that need to be considered. Um, proper kick tolerance and drilling avoids all sorts of uh, downhole problems. In today's technology, we're drilling faster and faster with less and less indicators to tell us uh, whether we're in trouble or not. So uh, it, the kick tolerance allows us to limit the amount of of uh, disastrous effects, taking uh, large kicks that eat up drilling time, or uh, even the advent of blowouts and so on. Um, so it improves our, our drilling methodology, uh, makes it more cost effective, and so on. So, but before we get into the actual uh, metrics of uh, kick tolerance, I think there's a couple of items that we really need to talk about that directly relate to uh, kick tolerance and kick intensity. Now, mind you, make sure that you you uh, think about these in in two different aspects uh, later on in the talk, and I'll show you why. Uh, there's a relationship between these uh, the test pressures on the on the casing shoes and, and casing design. You know, a lot of times we put in safety margins for just about everything uh, from our uh, testing of uh, material to the, to the performance testing of the well and so on. Uh, and, and we put these safety margins to give us usable room. But for the, the uh, intent of this discussion, let's, let's consider where we are when we get down to the math, no matter what our uh, integrity tests give us, uh, we're, we're using that number as a hard number. You're going to hear the terms or have hear, heard the terms of FIT, PIT, and LOT. These terms mean uh, formation integrity test. In some parts of the world, it's called a pressure integrity test. And in other areas where it isn't well defined, it is called a leak off test. Okay. So the formation integrity test by itself is testing the formation and the bond to the, to the casing shoe just below casing. Usually that's the weakest point uh, between there and that point in the next uh, casing horizon, but not always. But in a formation integrity test or PIT, <laughs> the, um, the pressure uh, margin that is set is set by the engineer in the design of the uh, well bore and its casing points to a known gradient pressure uh, where that casing is being set. A lot of times this is a delineation of a field where the information is uh, well documented uh, over a number of different wells and easy to uh, replicate. 
but in LOTs, the leak-off test is usually performed to a microfracture. In other words, you're going to pressure up uh, that shoe till it actually starts to break down. Now, you don't want to get uh, break it down too far, but only when a uh, leak off of pressure occurs and a slight uh, micro fracturing of the well. Now it'll be reevaluated with uh, bond logs and so on. But once you micro fracture that leak off test, and again, these are in areas where we don't know what those horizon pressures are, they have to be established. So they will actually. Uh, take a test mud once you've drilled out a few feet from below the casing. In that drill out, uh, uh, API usually uh, indicates that 15 to 50 feet is okay. It really depends on the uh, constitution of the formation itself. And uh, then you will pressure up on a test mud until that test pressure creates a leak off and, and a microfracture. Then they will back that pressure off and call that a fixed hard number, okay? Now, that number is related to obviously losses at the shoe and if, and if the losses became extreme at any one time, then those losses at the shoe, and it doesn't matter where, whether it's at surface conductor pipe, I hope you can see my mouse, or at any of the other horizons in the well bore, then that, that creates or constitutes the, the possibility of having an underground blowout, if not uh, caught soon enough, or a surface blowout uh, beyond the, the uh, bond of the casing all the way to the surface. And obviously we don't wanna do that. Today, the real challenge in managed pressure and underbalanced drilling is to extend as few casing points as possible to the well bore, thereby, thereby uh, the well costs are down, mud costs are down, and we get this extended uh, casing shoe. But the problem still exists is that the horizon, the weakness of that horizon to open hole to the shoe has to be measured somehow, and we measure that with kick intensity and tolerances. So, so let's talk a little bit about about how this is looked at from a testing standpoint. Whether it's a leak off test, as you see here in this blue area to the top, and there's a departure uh, from this line, fracture is starting to occur. Again, this is done in known area or unknown areas where we don't know what the gradient uh, fracture is of that formation. In areas where we do, some level point along this line here will actually be predetermined uh, by the company and the engineers, and that's where the casing point will be set. So in an FIT and not looking for a microfracture, I will only slowly pressure up to that known horizon or, or pressure point and then call it good. From that point on, either the LOT, which is here, or the FIT along the pressure regimen, which is here, then becomes our MASB, our maximum allowable surface pressure. And this is a hard number, even though we may add a margin of safety of 10 to 20%, we will consider that number a hard number and not to be exceeded at any given time. And once we've done that, that MASP is then equated to an equivalent mud weight. The equivalent mud weight then is referenced as our maximum allowable mud weight or our MASP, our maximum allowable surface pressure read at the surface, all right? So with this line, this hard number of pressure in the well bore established, we will then drill out from that casing shoe and continue to our next horizon. Now, hopefully nothing happens on the, going on to the next horizon. And so long as there are uh, no unexpected circumstances, we should be able within the casing program to reach the next casing point without problems. But as well defined as we can be based on uh, hoping we have no problems, 
it's the old adage that you that you design for the worst and hope for the best. That way you're always within the margins in the ball game, so to speak. So, so what ends up happening is we come up with an additional term called MAASB. And that MAASB is the maximum allowable anticipated surface pressure that we should not exceed. Now, what does that mean? Where does that come into play? Well, as we continue to, to drill forward in the open hole, our mud weight does not stay static with gradient pressures. And as we drill deeper and deeper and gradient pressures increase, so do our mud weights in relationship to that gradient pressure. And with changes in, in uh, bottom hole assemblies and changes with uh, hydrostatic pressures, as our mud weights go up, the MAASP at the surface goes down. Now that's our margin of, of I guess you could say, of workable horsepower in PSI. So uh, as a quick example, if I had a, an equivalent maximum mud weight of 15.5, and I drill out from the casing shoe at 10.5, I've got a five pound differential of MAASP within to work with. And I would want to convert that to a PSI, right? So let me show you what that kind of looks like uh, in this example. So if we're drilling uh, this well, and in this well, uh, whether on or offshore, remember my MASP is a hard number. I can't exceed that at any given point, uh, regardless of where my uh, mud weight is. So in this example, the casing shoe, uh, let's call it 4,500 feet, and my current mud weight is nine pounds, okay? Then this is my test drill out mud weight. It would then establish for me an MASP of 2,906 PSI. Now I did, a, I did a test up on it and so on, right? And so my established MASP is 2906. But as I increase my mud weight, let's say my mud weight goes uh, up and is now established at 12.4, some distance below the casing shoe. Well at 12.4 and minus my nine pound test mud weight out from the shoe, that gives me a differential pressure. Now, if you guys are on your, on, uh, your calculators real quick, you'll notice that that differential pressure can also be expressed in a mud weight is the only amount of room I have left before I can't do anything at all except to set the next casing point, right? So in fact, my maximum allowable surface pressure express, expressed in PSI is, let's see, let me move myself down here. Anybody know what that is by off tan? It's going to be 795 PSI. Now, the expressed uh, estimated mud weight at, at where I am right now is the same as my expressed mud weight. Okay. But did anybody uh, look at what the um, MASP is in a maximum mud weight. The difference between that and where we are right now with the current mud weight is our window of operation called the MAASP. Let me see if I still can move through this slide. If you did a uh, calculation on uh, 2906, you can at 4,500 feet, you can come up with an equivalent mud weight. You would divide the 2906 by 0 0.052 uh, by 4,500 feet should give you a mud weight of what? Let's see if I can do that for you real quickly. Yeah, because my answer is not coming up. So divided by 4,500 feet. Hello. 4,500. So, 2906. 
you got quite a, a bit of room there. Let me, at any rate, let's go on with the next one. My, my slide is popping all over the place. There we go. All right. Now, so you have a fracture point. Once we've established what MASP and MAASP is, uh, we now uh, have a formation pressure and a fracture pressure to deal with. In this example here, we're looking at a formation pressure of 3182 down there on the bottom left. Up at top, the fracture pressure is at 5,000 psi. Now, if, if everything by our current mud weight is fine, I've got 1,818 psi of working room in my MAASP uh, before I have to stop where I am. Now, with that in mind, if I took a kick or an influx at some point, that would mean that I'm underbalanced in my mud weight based on formation pressure. If that is the case, let me see if I can put in here. Let's put in an example of 600 PSI on the shut-in drill pipe pressure. Now, why am I using shut-in drill pipe pressure for this? Well, because it's a virgin fluid and it's my best medium to recognize a kick in the hole. If I take the shut-in drill pipe pressure and my current mud weight and extrapolate that, that would give me the 3182 formation pressure as a balance, right? Now, with this kick of 600 PSI, what have I got to do? Well, I've got to go in there and raise the mud weight like I was talking about before. Now, raising the mud weight above this 13.6 is going to be a 600 PSI differential uh, calculated into a, expressed in mud weight. As I do that, I'm back to equal on my formation uh, pressure, equal to the formation pressure. And I'm still 1,218 PSI away from my fracture pressure. That again becomes my MAASP margin. As we keep moving further and further, or closer and closer, if you will, to that 5,000 margin, then what ends up happening is I have less and less room to work with. Now, one thing I want you to take into consideration is that raising the mud weight alone for balance isn't the only applied pressure that occurs in the well. We have a lot of other items that come into play, uh, including ECDs, uh, back pressures based on uh, rotating heads and choke manifolds and, and uh, pump pressures and and, uh, and the, all these pressures, including an increase in a, in a uh, kick environment, all combine to take away margins from our MAASP. And of course, the smaller it goes, uh, the smaller the differential becomes, let's say, the, the less and less room I have to work with. Now, many of you know that if we're in a kick situation, Anytime we've taken an influx, we've got to now uh, stabilize that well bore. And when we're doing it, we're shutting the well in, we're putting it on choke, we're finding a pump uh, a circulation point that we have to manage with. And guess what? Not everybody learns how to, to ac accurately get a kick out of the hole. And because of that, even choke manipulation allows for and circulation, depending on the method being used, is going to allow for expansion of that gas bubble in the open hole as it approaches the, uh, the casing chute. Now, in well control, when we're talking about choke control and kick tolerance, we're looking at the rising or the, or the movement of that bubble to the casing chute, which is considered that fracture point, the weakest point in the well. And since that is the case, it's really, really important that, uh, that how we manipulate that bubble up and keep it uh, compressed 
uh, does not expand because that bubble expanding uh, in the well is going to increase the casing pressure as it rises. And so if you're not really proficient on the choke or the people that you put on the choke are not really proficient and there is a, there is a, um, uh, a large amount of open hole at which to manipulate the kick, the likelihood of us exceeding our MAASP against that shoe is very evident. So we have moved away from just uh, uh, manipulation on the choke to looking at what is the maximum kick that we can actually tolerate when the well is shut in. Now, having said that, I can tell you that once a kick has been determined and it actually occurs, then what ends up happening at that point is the, the kick needs to stabilize. And though your pit gain initially may show X number of barrels, what typically happens is as the well stabilizes and balances out the wellbore pressure to the formation pressure, the kick size grows until it, until it stabilizes. And as an example, an eight barrel kick or a 10 barrel kick could easily become a 15 or 20 barrel kick realized once it is stabilized. So we look at kick tolerance as a maximum and we also look at it from the basis of it being a gas rather than gas and liquid or salt water or whatnot type kick, because this is the worst case scenario. Being the worst case scenario, uh, we want to make sure that that kick intensity in barrels and maximum kick volume in barrels uh, doesn't exceed our calculations. Uh, in a little while, we're going to go over the calculations on on both the tolerance and intensity. One is a, is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, calculation. The other one requires a little more manipulation based on annular volumes around bottom hole assemblies and so on. But going back to this example here, the, uh, the window then becomes 1,218 PSI based on uh, reaching fracture. Now, I move my mud weight up, as I did in this one here. My mud weight at the, at the well was 13.6, but I took a 600 pound kick or 600 PSI kick. I had to raise my mud weight back up to establish a uh, static kill mud weight, in which case, if my mud weight went up, then my available horsepower or MASP went down. Now in this example, there's plenty of room between those, but what happens, consider the fact that your, your kick tolerance or your MAASB is not 1,218, but your kick tolerance is 512. Well, you've lost a lot of room to be able to manipulate the next um, uh, influx or kick in the wellbore. Today, we're seeing lots of wells drilled in the horizontal, and there's still a thousand feet of vertical rise where the gas needs to go till it reaches a chute. Some of these extended wells that go out 20, 25,000 feet horizontally, drop down vertical, uh, vertically three, four, 500 feet, and, and in the actual curve of the well, you might have seven to 800 feet of curve. Together, you may have 1,200 feet of vertical rise to the shoe. And, it, and the uh, determining the kick volume and intensity on in time without special tools like PWD are very difficult. We're using uh, engines that are governed on our pumps, so we see no changes there. At any rate, detection becomes a real critical issue. So again, as this mud weight moves up, my ability to work within this window of 1218 to the fracture point goes down. Once your fracture point is reached, you, you're at a dead stop. You can try to heal it up uh, with chemicals and whatnot, but it'll never be as good as it was originally. And you may have to consider as an engineer to re-evaluate your casing program at that point. Now, I know some of you are probably going, 
but what's going to happen to my production when I get there? Well, your production flow rate may go down if you're forced into a setting casing or a smaller casing that wasn't anticipated at the time. So let's look at this thing. Now, let me give you kind of an example here. The maximum allowable surface pressure after the kill of the operation. So what do we need to take into consideration here? Well, part of what we need to consider is what between our test depth and the LOT. What the first thing you have to come up with is what is your MASP? Once the MASP is established along, and that's established by this and the original mud weight, the test mud weight at the shoe depth right here. Once you've established that MASP, that's again, a hard number, right? You would take the current mud weight at the current depth and what that pressure is plus the kick, which is this 500 PSI. These two numbers currently are not gonna help us establishing what our MASP is. Once we take the current pressure uh, with this mud weight, the kick in the hole, and the depth that are at, we would take the difference between that and the uh, MASP at the shoe, which you'll end up uh, seeing is about 1198 PSI. So drilling deeper, that is our, uh, that is our current working margin at 1198, and any kick that comes in along with the differential pressures we've got to work with will be the margin of window that we have to operate within. Now, again, safety margins are uh, determined in well conditions and field information and so on. And a lot of us uh, need to work with these safety margins to make sure that we would not turn around and exceed them so we can get casing down. In this case, a 20% margin on, on 1,200 PSI, obviously would be about 240 PSI off of that uh, MAASP. I'm going to stop right here. And how you want to ask, see if there are any questions, a uh, couple of things that come up? Well, we have questions, but they're not related to the uh, math part. OK. Uh, basically, uh, but why we do the FIT test and um, when we do it. Okay, all right. And, so, yeah, and sure, go ahead. You gotta, do you have another one related to that? Yeah, you can, no, not, not related. So you can finish this one and then I'll ask you the other one. Okay, so FITs are done uh, at the time that the casing is set. Once the casing is uh, drilled down and cemented and pressure tested, they will do a negative pressure test once the concrete has held up on the casing. They will then drill out that, that uh, uh, cement until they're about 15 feet below the casing chute. At which points we now have formation and a casing chute exposed to the inner wellbore. And then we will do a pressure up on that uh, casing to make sure that we have good tolerance, uh, good FIT. Now the FIT again is done, it's a predetermined pressure. The engineers in the office that have designed the casing program to make sure that we can reach that maximum because he's got in his program at the next casing point, could be, a lot of people don't do it at surface but they will do it in the intermediate and or in the production string or, or uh, second intermediate horizon, but they'll do that below the, the uh, uh, water source, uh, aquifer, and then further down. And again, it's a predetermined value. The LOT is unknown. And it is, it is done in the same, at the same points, but the actual pressure has to be determined uh, to leak off. And that's actually a formation fracture. Okay, now do you have another one? Yeah, we have one. Why the casing shoe is a weak point? The casing shoe typically is set to cover um, gradient pressures that, that uh, cannot be extended any deeper without losses. So they always reach a point uh, where they're at a maximum mud weight to the formation gradient. 
And again, you don't want to break it down so that you have an underground blowout. So casing uh, shoes are, are determined where they literally cannot go any deeper with any deeper mud weight for control. Once they drill out of those set casing points, a lot of times they can revert or regress their mud weights and, and drill out with a lower mud weight to reach the next horizon with higher mud weights. So what they're trying to do is to get the casing as deep and as, and as big as they can, as far as they can, before they have to set the next one. And, and the idea of the larger diameter, obviously, is for greater flow rates. And the, and the deepest point, it gives them the best control to reaching their target. Okay? Okay. All right. So let's keep going then. So once we've been able to establish that with our MASPs and, and realizing where our margins are to work with, let's look at kick tolerance as a definition. And you'll see it says it's the maximum gas volume, or quote, worst case scenario, for any degree, degree of underbalance, which we talked about in the previous slide, you know, which uh, circulation can still be performed. In other words, circulation and or well control circulation that can be performed without exceeding the weakest point of the well bore. Now to ask, answer the, uh, the qu previous question, think about this. <coughs> Maybe it isn't the casing shoe that is, that is weakened, but a regressive zone below the casing shoe. Let's say we didn't get to that horizon with our casing point. We just, for whatever reason, couldn't get down there. Well, now I got another problem. And if we work into a regressive zone, and we can't manage that regressive zone, uh, I may at some point before my proposed next casing point may have to set a liner to cover up and get through that regressive zone. That happens offshore with frequency, except the problem is it changes your whole casing program as you get down with maybe you were expecting a seven inch production casing on the bottom or or a five and seven eighths casing on the bottom, you're gonna end up with a four inch production casing or three and seven eighths production casing. Now you say, okay, but I, I still made it. Well, you did, but your flow rates have changed. And if you're trying to do the finances based on that well, and you now uh, cannot circulate up the production at the same rate that you expected, your payout's gonna be different and your control on, on uh, tools and stuff is gonna be different based on uh, what you've contracted. So it really has a, a domino effect at the, at the bottom of the well. So our idea is try to meet the design casing program for, for maximum effect. And one way we do that is, is looking at and constantly monitoring our kick tolerance in uh, volume based on that, right? So. Uh, remember, shutting in the well, uh, when you take a kick, uh, is not going to be the initial pit gain that you see, but it will morph into uh, what the stable amount is, and you want to make sure that your kick intensity and tolerances is uh, within those anticipated uh, minimums, right? So, now look at the formula I, I show at the bottom of the screen here. So maximum kick tolerance in a mud weight is equal to the uh, equivalent mud weight of the LOT. Now, the LOT is a total, remember, total pressure of the uh, wellbore hydrostatic plus what pressure I pump up the wellbore till I get a leak off. So that, that pressure converted to a mud weight minus whatever I am at my current mud weight times my TVD at the shoe divided by the current TVD. So the difference between uh, the, the shoe TVD and where we are currently. That's how you get that maximum mud weight uh, 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 intensity. Now, it's going to be expressed in a differential. Just keep that in mind, okay? So, 
It doesn't always work that way, but hydrostatic pressure tends to increase with depth as our gradient pressure in the formation increases. These, as they go up, to be it balanced, I've got to raise my mud weight, which means I'm always approaching and using up that AMASP I'm measuring at the surface. But what happens if our differential went to zero? What would you be able to do at that point? Nothing. MAS can never, ever reach zero. Because if it does, then I have no ability even to turn the pumps on to circulate and gain control of the well. I can't put any lost circulation material down hole. I can't uh, circulate the known methods that are out there that are typical and well controlled to bring us back to even. And in fact, that actually happened on an offshore well not too long ago. And I will tell you, I was literally uh, teaching a class and the one of the engineers said, what happens when my well is rated at 15K? I have 15K bottom hole pressures. I have an equivalent 15K uh, mud weight in the hole. And he looked at me, he goes, what would you do? And I told him, I said, the first thing I would do is fire the engineer that brought us here because he obviously didn't understand where his control points were. And that didn't get me extra brownie points, I'm sure, but the truth be told, he exceeded his margins. Now, if we have lots of room, in other words, that the differential between the two is large, I probably have a pretty large kick tolerance and, and ability to handle just about anything that comes along. So without problems, I'll reach that next casing point with with very little effort. But if my margins are small, and I've seen many wells where their margins in the, at depth weren't any more than uh, one to 200 PSI, depending on where they were, adds a very difficult condition for the engineer and the supervisors on site if they don't do something different and going further isn't gonna be a good thing. With unexpected influxes, um, and frack bashing is a good unexpected influx. Unexpected influxes come from horizons that usually communicate from below, below where we are, below where we expect. Frack bashing, in other words, being in a field next to a field that is being fracked, sometimes communicates with a field that is unexpected in its communication. And all of a sudden, you have very high pressures. Uh, it points along your uh, drilling of your well that you've not experienced or not expected. And if that occurs and your kick tolerance is being used up or is low, you may be expected to see high circulating rates. And, and these influxes may eat up your margins and put you in a very uh, untenable position. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful about it. And again, design your wells with uh, the ability to, to keep as large a margin uh, kick tolerance between your MAASP and your MASP to the last casing point. Now, oops, I'm going backwards, sorry. So here's just a, a little uh, a graph to give you an idea. Now I took the pressure back from our previous slides where our fracture pressure was 5,000, which would be here. And our balance point at the uh, formation balance would be here. I've got a maximum kick tolerance here, uh, even after that 600 PSI influx with 1,218 PSI and to whatever a convertible mud weight that would be, right? But as I move along towards and get closer and closer to that maximum anticipated mud weight of whatever that fracture pressure is, as I go up, my kick tolerance goes down and it decreases as my maximum mud weight increases. So my margin to work with is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And in fact, if I reach zero, it's too late, I'm in trouble. So somewhere in that 20% margin is guess what? This 20% margin here is my next casing point. Like it or not, that's where it's gonna be. 
you may have to, in the casing design, move your casing point up and then relook at your target area from that point down. Because uh, you cannot you cannot reach zero on the thing. Okay. All right, so considerations based on kick tolerance. You have to considerate your bottom hole assembly as in taking uh, X number barrels of kick in what that kick height and volume would look like. You're going to have to look at PSI per foot of the type of mud weight that you've got and the hydrostatic pressure that it displaces. You're going to have to look at what's left of and the type of fluids that you've got as to different circulating pressures or ECDs, estimated circulating densities. Now, you may hear this in APL, uh, uh, annular pressure loss in the, in the annulus and so on. But what ends up happening here is uh, if we're using oil-based fluids and they've got a very low ECD deal, uh, then, then in fact, you may not be applying a whole lot of added pressure, but whatever pressure is calculated has to be taken away from the MASP. And, and since we assume that it's going to be a gas kick, the height of the influx uh, translates to either a uh, 0 0.05 or 0 0.0. 104 a gas gradient per foot we're going to have to take that into consideration now there are other ones we're going to have to do again uh, choke pressure during an operation you might be doing a driller's method or a weight and weight method or even a bullhead very very hard on the shoe even though it's not a circulator but but if we're doing weight and weight or the driller's method ecds and and it depends on your organization, what information you're using based on the mud weight, viscosities and so on. You could use Bingham's equation, Newton or the modified version between the two, but ECDs as a rule of thumb may be as high as 10% as, uh, 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 of your current mud weight uh, in PSI, so uh, be careful, right? Choke back pressure is uh, is all about uh, choke manipulation, and if you get if you're not really well vetted in the operation you're at, you may create gas expansion that is going to take away surface pressures uh, before you get the gas bubble into the casing. Now, that's a really important part. Your kick tolerance goes way up once the the top of the bubble and the majority of the gas is in the casing. The more it's in the casing, your, your um, lack of control based on tolerance goes way up and, you, and you're, you're, um, you're saving yourself lots of room. But it's when that bubble reaches the shoe, it, when it applies its greatest pressure, and that's where we apply the, uh, the maximum of kick tolerance. But there's a lot of moving parts in this thing, and I'm going to show you what you're going to have to take into consideration uh, to, to uh, get the right number for you on this. Now, so choke manipulation, make sure you've got somebody who's well vetted in, in getting a bubble out of the well bore. That's all I can tell you. They got to know what they're doing on that choke. Uh, if you've got a super choke and a, or a computerized uh, choke that is making its own calculation, make sure the data is correct, right? Now, I, over the years, I've met some pretty smart engineers and the best at uh, kick tolerance I've ever seen is a gentleman named Frank French you see at the bottom of the screen. Please write down his website because he has a kick tolerance calculator that I found to be absolutely invaluable. And he's at www.kicktolerance.com and uh, you can make a deal and get a copy of it from Frank. Uh, Frank uh, lives in Scotland and uh, has proven to me many a time to be a great resource. And uh, anyway, so uh, take that down, www.kicktolerance.com. So let's look at some of the information you need to have to do a good calculation on kick tolerance. Obviously, shoe depth and wellbore depth in TVD. You're going to need to know uh, open hole diameters and drill pipes in open hole and collars in open hole. And this helps determine 
the height of the kick, okay? The length of the drill collars become your smallest tolerance in your annular where your greatest APL annular pressure loss occurs. So it's really important to be able to know. And when a gas enters the well bore, the height becomes accentuated along the drill collars. Uh, so that's where you're going to take in your biggest influx. Your maximum allowable mud weight. This is a hard number. They're saying you cannot exceed 13 pound uh, equivalent pressures at the shoe. If you go 13.1, you're losing fluid. Okay. Kick density here in this example uh, is two pound per gallon. That is a mixed gas mud weight, but it is pure gas. So it's worst case scenario. You're, in this example, I'm using a 10.5 mud weight currently. I have a kick gradient, again, a gas gradient that relates to this. A mud gradient, 0.546, that relates to this. And a fracture, oh, I'm sorry, and a kick in, uh, in the shoe uh, or below the shoe of 400 PSI. Come on back. Fracture pressure at the shoe. This is a hard number related to this, to the 13 pound mud weight. And the formation pressure is 4768. So one of the things we've got to determine is what is our pressure currently at formation in relationship to my mud weight. If my mud weight's 10.5 and I'm 400 pounds under to reach this balance point, I've got to figure out what my next equivalent mud weight's gonna be. But we're looking for tolerances. So the difference between those mud weights, where I'm currently at here, and where my MAMW is, is my kick tolerance in uh, pounds per gallon mud weight. But that doesn't tell me what it is in barrels. To do that, I've got to come over here and look at annular capacities, both an open hole of drill pipe, if there is any, and drill collars, and there is some, okay? So here's how you can go about doing this. This is kick intensity at number one. So I'm gonna get kick intensity by turning around and taking my shut-in drill pipe pressure, divided by my 052 conversion, divided by my well depth TVD. That's bottom of the hole. Once I have that, then I need to take my MAS, I need to know what my MASP is. I'm gonna take that maximum mud weight of 13, subtract the 10.5, gives me 2.5, multiply that simple hydrostatic of 052 times my shoe, which is where the pressure is gonna be applied. Now I wanna determine what the kick mud weight is. I'm sorry, what the kick height is. So I will take now my MASP minus my shut-in pressure on my drill pipe, and then I will divide that between the mud and the kick gradient. Back up. So I'll take the mud gradient minus the kick gradient, and then divide that into my MASP minus my shut-in drill pipe pressure. That gives me kick height. And if I remember correctly, that should give me a kick height of about 450 feet. Because the gradient difference is, um, I think that comes out as 198 PSI. Let's see, I think so. Then I'm gonna take kick to get kick volume at the drill collars. I'm gonna take the kick height times the drill pipe, drill collar capacity, annular capacity. Once I've got that, then I can go to kick volume at the shoe by taking the height times the drill pipe and uh, an open hole capacity. And I think that the kick height and the drill pipe capacity is pretty much identical or very close to at 450 feet. Now remember that changes my MASP based on the loss of hydrostatic. So now I can take my kick volume on bottom at the, and then my kick volume at the shoe times the frac pressure at the shoe divided by my formation pressure. And that should give me my kick tolerance. 
Tolerance is the lesser of the two volumes calculated between equations four and six. And it's safer to take the smaller amount because it's more conservative. Make sense? Okay. Now hopefully I'll leave that up here for just a little bit so that you can see what I've got. And you can write it down, but again, there are some uh, there are some good formulas, good programs out there you can use that are pretty much fill in the blank and, and come up with a, a good kick tolerance in volume and in uh, and in height. So then you can always convert that to a PSI. Okay. So next, let's just kind of uh, tie this together. So it's a kick tolerance that is usually expressed in a differential in barrels. So if I'm at 15.5 and I've been told my kick tolerance is 2.5 barrels or 10 barrels or whatnot, uh, that's, that's gonna be my, my tolerance in barrels. But I would might like to see it in expressed in mud weight. So it may uh, be expressed that I have a 2.5 pound per gallon differential in, in uh, mud weight or a 10.8 uh, barrel increase in my maximum at that point in time. In static, right, static conditions, MASP, uh, again, you just convert that to a height in barrels of, below the casing. Your tolerance changes all the time, folks, because of applied pressures and changes in safety margins and, and, uh, and operations. Height of the bottom hole assembly changes, uh, uh, diameter of the casings changed between points. So it's really a moving target all the time. So in conclusion to this thing, be careful in your expressions of kick tolerance, whether in barrels or margins and PSI. Make sure the people that you're with and that you're working with, both in the office and in the field, understands what uh, values you're talking about and then be consistent with them in their dealings with them. The mud engineers and the, and the drillers, they wanna know how big of a kick can they take? They want it in barrels, right? And they will set their alarms based on that. Your, you and, and the supervisors may be expressing this in, in uh, tolerances of PSI. Just make sure that you don't transpose them and get the uh, people confused where they're setting up their uh, alarm margins uh, to the wrong value. And understand that a lot of applied pressures come into play based on uh, kick tolerances. So if, you, if you've got these uh, uh, different issues and, and thinking a little further outside the box, what would be the worst case scenario? Then you need to practice and, and drill and, and, and do site drills based on getting those teams to shut the wells in. I spent a quite a large amount of time in Saudi and, and in uh, MENA, and I can tell you when you have seven or eight different uh, languages spoken on a, on a rig site, uh, it, can, it can get confusing very quickly. You can have Spanish, and you can have uh, English, and you can have uh, Farsi, and you can have Russian, and you can have all sorts of uh, the worst of them, you can have Scottish language. I love you Scottish brothers, but your brogue uh, sometimes is difficult to understand. So it's, it's, it's extremely important that you're, you have very uh, clear presence of, of uh, what they understand in relation to your kick uh, tolerances. And, and, uh, but it is a moving target and it has to be constantly looked at for changes in downhole. Don't overrun your casing points. Uh, just thinking the next casing point's a hard number is not true. Only the pressure is a hard number. And the uh, downtime can eat up your profitability, which means you may not have a budget to drill the next well. Or you may be the engineer I don't want on my next well. So be careful. Small kick tolerance is almost always, always, always considered a well control condition. Treat it as such. Okay. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions, Nahal, if you got some. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, well, we have a lot, actually. Oh, we do. So, yeah. so uh, first question, uh, why MM, 
uh, why M A A S P can't exceed zero? Because once you, it's a great question. It, it, this is think of this as your your available working pressure, and that means that that available working pressure comes in the form of mud weight, of a back pressure, of circulating pressure, and choke control. If I've only got say 500 psi. It is, the, it is the total of all those applied pressures. Once I reached zero, the well fractures at the shoe or the weakest point that I'm calculating to. And once it starts to fracture, you're, you're on your way to an underground blowout or worse, a surface blowout. You're in a full blown well condition. And once that, that formation breaks down, well control may not be able to fix it you have run out of options at that point. So having a safety margin based on that number, giving yourself even the, the, uh, the barest of minimums may still be able to gain control of it. But you have exceed that MAASB, you may, can, you may exceed your control points above it. And if it does, gas will find its way to the surface and you can have yourself a real dicey situation at that point. But good question, next. Um, have we seen kicks in unconventional reservoirs? Oh, yes. And in some cases, you may see in unconventional reservoirs, well, yes. What ends up happening and the way to eliminate a lot of the kicks in unconventional is to set the, the last casing point as far into the curve as you can so that you minimize the um, the level or the vertical lift of the well bore from its toe to the casing point. But what typically happens in the unconventional reservoirs, where before <coughs> our, <coughs> we, we would have pit gains, uh, we would see uh, changes in flow, we would see, we would see changes in pump uh, conditions like a pump trying to accelerate to fill up a void. There were some real direct indicators to tell us a kick was down hole. But if your vertical pressure margin doesn't change, the gas tends to fill up the, uh, the horizontal portion of unconventional as a gas saturation. It also will fill up the vertical cracks, uh, anything that's high in the well bore. And let's face it, even I'm not as good as I used to be in being able to drill a perfectly lateral well. It is not purely horizontal. It has dips and weaves in it. Sometimes the toe is higher than the casing point is. So you get a lot of buildup of gas in that, in that lateral and sooner or later it has to go somewhere. If the casing shoe is set close to the, to the end toe of the, of the curve, then most of the gas that comes out goes up into the casing. It's still a kick, but it's manageable in the casing. When the casing is at the top of the curve, and a lot of curves may have five, seven hundred feet of build angle to them, plus 20 feet out and two degree drop and dip, do the math, you can add several hundred feet of, of effective vertical rise to the, to the casing shoot. Could be a major problem. So the answer to that is yes, we just have to think of the dynamics of it a little bit more than, than just as a simple kick. Okay, another question. Someone is asking about the constraints. Uh, so he's saying my constraints are uh, pore pressure, formation pressure, and EDC. Uh, just that collapse gradient is not a parameter like formation integrity. Say that one more time now. Yeah, sure. So someone is asking about the constraints that he has. Uh, is it just poor pressure and EDC? He's asking is collapse gradient not a parameter uh, like formation integrity? Well, formation integrity is an issue because if we go back here and look at the, um, let's see, let me go back to here. You, the, the items that you have to take into that start with is formation pressure. You're going to have formation pressure or fracture pressure at the formation and fracture pressure at the shoe. Now we were just talking about tolerance in 
at the shoe, but guess what? You could have uh, a maximum mud weight where the, um, it would be unusual, but where your fracture pressure at the shoe is not entirely different than the fracture pressure at the formation that you're in, in which case your window is just the difference between those two, right? And you can exceed one and in the management of it, exceed the other. So in managed pressure drilling, where we're looking at a 50 PSI window, and yet we've set the shoe well into the curve, well then the fracture pressure you have to worry about is then the formation fracture pressure on the lateral. That, that, that has happened before too. So if you've got great integrity of the shoe, but, but very poor integrity walking a marginal fracture line in the formation, then guess what? That's the point at which you have to manage. So that could happen, okay? Okay, so uh, another question. Okay. Someone wa wants you to elaborate more on the HPHT wells in order to calculate the kick tolerance. Well, and that, that's exactly based on what I just said. The kick tolerance in high pressure, high temperature wells, now you're taking into account, you're going to have to take into account uh, temperature variation as well. Because uh, the temperature uh, differential in, in an HTHP and make it a an extended horizontal unconventional type well as, as uh, the greater that differential the temperature affects the mud weight you're going to be walking a, a fracture line with a varying mud weight in different parts of the well. Uh, it can get very dicey for you uh, if your tolerance is, is below 100 psi. Uh, and in a lot of cases uh, and, and, and today with some of the better um, super chokes out there that are computer operated, uh, they do several um, adjustments uh, per minute, somewhere up to a couple hundred adjustments per minute. So they're constantly trying to keep that window at, within that 100 uh, uh, PSI margin, that kick tolerance margin, the MAASP margin, right? And uh, but you also have to, uh, you've got a moving target with, again, the ECDs, the type of, and that should be measured with, with a real good PWD tool at the uh, toe. Uh, I think the, the better the software gets on these systems, I think the, the, the more comfortable we're going to get, and it really is going to boil down to, is the data going in accurate? That there aren't glitches in the data, data or changes in the temperature um, uh, readings uh, as it extrapolates back to the top of the mud weight. Um, but it, these are the challenges you guys are going to be facing in the future and, and they're going to uh, uh, challenge your ability to, to maintain smaller and smaller margins. And I'm telling you, in, you may be finding it, there's a balance point between efficiency and, and um, accuracy. And, and if we do not allow ourselves margins to work within, then we're going to see greater and greater uh, examples of, of the wells getting away from us. And uh, there's a point at which efficiency is pretty much maximized on the upside of the bell curve. And I don't want anybody operating on the downside of the bell curve or the top of the bell curve, because again, you're, you're, um, you're putting yourself at risk. I think as we get automated systems out there and the rest of it, it'll be uh, the exposure to the human beings out there will be minimized, but it'll never be eliminated. So safety comes first every time. I'll take one more. Yeah, one more question. So someone is asking about the calculations of the kick tolerance. He's asking, um, should he do three calculations for one well um, for gas, water, and oil because it differs from the tile to kick? Yes. Every, every, time, every time one of these parameters changes, you recalculate. It's a moving target. So if your mud weight changes, if your mud type changes, because what's going to change mainly in mud type? You're going to change the ECDs of that mud and, and uh, changes in bit nozzles. 
let's say that they have the same uh, bit and the rest of it, but we're trying to get different uh, clearances of, of rock around the face of the bit. Even changes in that, you're changing circulating pressures by changing bit nozzles. So any of these parameters change, recalculate. And have somebody else look at your calcu calculation so that you can validate it. You may see a number and get blind to whatever else is that you've got going on that may distract you. Always have somebody uh, reevaluate your calculation so at least two guys looked at it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Bernkamp. Uh, we would love to have you back if you have the time. Uh, and thank you so much for the great presentation. Thank you, everybody, well, for attending today. Thank you, and I hope it was helpful. Good luck, everyone. Yes. Good luck. Thank you so much, uh, and we'll see you guys tomorrow.